Hello everybody. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and uh, sorry about a slight delay. Um, we'll get kicked off straight away and welcome to this session. My name is Jonathan Goodhand. I'm a professor in conflict and development studies um, in the Department of Development Studies at SOAS and I'm currently convening the, the MSc um, research in research for international development. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to say um, a little bit about the course and I'm going to give a short kind of sample lesson to give you a flavour of the some of the issues that we, we look at in the in the course and then open it up to you for questions. Um, so let me start off by just so you know who I am and where I come from. I um, in a previous life, I used to be a, a development um, practitioner and I worked in the field for something like seven or eight years in uh, places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Central Asian Republics. Um, and I then subsequently did a, um, um, my PhD research and my, my, my work has been broadly on uh, um, the political economy of violent conflict. But why I'm giving you this introduction is that I'm particularly interested in the debates that we touch upon in this course, which are about how do we understand the links between policy, practice, evidence and theory. And so why, why is it important to be thinking about questions around method and evidence? Um, and Yep, here we are. So I suppose in many ways it's, it, it may, may seem quite obvious to you if you've had a bit of experience in the, in the world of development policy and practice. But certainly when I started off in, in the world of development practice some almost 30 years ago, um, it wasn't emphasised so much. Um, questions of data were, were not thought about sufficiently rigorously questions about the methodologies for developing that data um, were, were not interrogated sufficiently and there weren't sufficient questions about the evidence base for predominant policies and practices. Um, so I think over the last, certainly the last 20 years in, in particular, there's been a growing interest in questions about evidence in the world of international development. How do we know that whether if you are putting where, where you should make choices as a development donor, where should you be putting your, your money in to have the maximum impact? How do you know whether you're having an impact? In order to address poverty, should you be focusing on microenterprise or should you be focusing on a, a different field of, of activity? If you're DFID, um, should you be trying to address the causes of violent conflict or should be you be trying to mitigate the effects of violent conflict? All these kinds of questions are linked to questions of evidence and they're also linked to questions of how we develop evidence, um, how we generate evidence and whether we can trust that evidence to make informed decisions. Um, and so this course is, is really trying to grapple with those questions about how do we know, how do we make decisions? How do we know what is the most effective place to put, 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 put money? And how do we think about what, what um, international development um, workers and agencies often talk about, the underlying theories of change? What are the underlying assumptions about if you put, you, you intervene in one area, how do you think, what is your kind of chain of analysis, your causal chain of analysis to, to, to take you from these inputs into effects and broader impacts. So that's a by way of introduction that whether you are working as a, a, the coalface, if you like, as a development practitioner, implementing development programs, whether you are acting as a donor to make decisions about funding, or whether you're working in a think tank, um, for example, Chatham House or Inter Overseas Development Institute, or you are actually working as a, as a researcher but trying to engage with development processes, questions of evidence and methodology um, come up again and again. And it's, it's, it's understanding how to engage with evidence, how to engage with method 
is is a transferable skill that would uh, apply whether you're going to be working in the as a private sector consultancy contractor or whether you're going to be working for an NGO or a think tank and so on. So what I'm going to briefly say now is a little bit about the course itself and, and what you would be studying in this course and then I'm going to jump into a, a sample session plan. So first of all, who is it for? One thing to say about courses at SAS, they have an incredibly diverse student body and, and it's a range of, of different people coming from different backgrounds and different individual and personal trajectories. Um, we have a lot of people who come with experience in the world of developments as humanitarian practitioners, as development practitioners or as peace building practitioners who want to develop a stronger understanding of questions about evidence and research methods so they can be more confident when they engage with these debates in the, the real world of development practice. We have quite a few students who, who don't have experience in the world of development but want to make a transition into that kind of career and they see this as, as a good grounding for doing so. There are others who've worked in, in perhaps unrelated fields and they want to make a transition into the world of developments and again see this as a good base for, for doing so. And finally there are a number of students who, who see this course as a stepping stone to go on to further, um, further research as a PhD candidate or perhaps working in a think tank as a, as a kind of a researcher and policy analyst. And this gives them the skills and the grounding to do that. So let's go on to what, what it is you're going to, you would learn in the course of doing the, the masters. Well, obviously research methods is a fundamental part of this and you will be given a grounding in both quantitative and qualitative approaches to generating data, building on interdisciplinary perspectives and to enable you to, to make informed choices about what kinds of methods make most sense to answer these kinds of questions um, in, the, in the field of development. And to be able to, to select and to mix methods. How do we bring together more, more quantitative methods, large end studies with more fine grained ethnographic qualitative approaches? Of course, we will be focusing on the technical kind of questions about what research, um, good research consists of in terms of rigor and, and so forth. But we're also very interested in how these questions about choices are linked to political and disciplinary debates. And these are often contested debates, often based on very different starting points for, for how you see the world, how you interpret the world, um, and also often very kind of strong normative um, ideas about what the world should be like. So you know, this is not just about technical questions of, of method, it's, it's also about highly charged political questions. You will also learn about research design. So how do you, um, you know, set yourself a set of research questions and create um, a, an approach, a research design that allow, enables you to best answer those kinds of questions. How do you present your data when you have developed, when you have, when you have done your research? How do you present it in a, in a convincing way to policy audiences or to research audiences? So we, we also look at some very kind of uh, practical skills, which will be certainly useful after you finish the course about presenting research, about preparing policy briefs for policy audiences. How do you convince policymakers about your key messages? How do you attract their attention? How do you ensure that key messages from a very long and complex process of research are, are captured in a compelling and, and highly um, credible way for, 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 for policy audiences? So also, how do you pitch your research? And also, how do you develop academic pr um, presentations? So these are kind of some of the, the, the skills um, uh, that we that you, that you will um, be, be taught in the research and uh, this is the kind of the 
the, the broad um, structure of the course um, to give you an idea of, of, of the kinds of courses you will be doing um, and how it's broken down. So essentially, it's a 180 credit course. Um, of that, 120 credits are taught courses and 60 credits are go towards your dissertation. Let's start with the core courses. So there are three core courses that all students will do, which we think are essential to give you a grounding in quantitative and qualitative method. And, and one thing I should say as well, this is a unique course in the sense that it's taught jointly by the economics department and the development studies department. So you have got very high um, quality lectures around both quantitative and qualitative approaches. Um, the battlefields of method gives you a broad grounding in um, different research approaches, both qualitative and quantitative, and a lot of the key debates around the choices of, of, of methodological choices. Your statistical research methods and your, your research methods in international development give you um, a hard grounding in the quantitative approaches, in statistical analysis, regression analysis, survey-based approaches, large-end studies. Um, and so we have a nice mix of the development studies and the economics department um, areas of expertise feeding into the core courses, which give you a platform going forward in the course. You then have choices both from the development studies and uh, the economics departments. And there are a few examples given here, but it's a far larger, longer list um, of some in each department, some close to 20 options in, in, in each department. So you have a, a big range of options uh, to choose from, uh, of four, normally four options of 15 credits each. Some options may be 30 credits, so that would mean you would choose, um, you could have a, 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 you could, the options are between two to four um, optional modules. And this gives you the scope to pursue areas of personal interest, um, um, whether it's, it's, it's kind of thematic areas of interest or geographical areas of interest. So for example, there you can see you can choose specifically to focus on China and uh, you could choose on other, uh, make a choice to, uh, to look at other, focus on other regions of the world as well. And finally, the, the dissertation is really the, it, you, you, it's your opportunity to really focus in on a subject that you, you really are passionate about, really interests you, and you want to explore in greater depth. Um, and so you, you have the first um, term and a half to, to think about what that may be. You can spend time talking to, your, to, to different lecturers to, to make decisions about that. Um, by early in term two, then you will make an initial choice um, about what your dissertation topic will be. And then by um, early, the beginning of term three, you will embark upon uh, your, your dissertation topic. That gives you an idea a little bit about what you will learn and the kind of the structure. And so to finish off before we jump into the, uh, to the, uh, the, the sample lesson, um, there's a question obviously well, well what will you do afterwards um how will this benefit you um pra in practical and very concrete terms and uh, our students have gone on to a whole range of, of different um sets of experiences and, and job opportunities since um, so, um since studying the course um so it is very, very, very varied, but just this gives you ex some examples of the kind of positions some of our previous students have gone on to, whether it's through uh, working with official aid organizations in, in the kind of the donor agency areas such as DFID or the World Bank. Many end up working with, with NGOs and uh, as many of you will know, there's a kind of a, a burgeoning area of you know, of growth in the NGO sector around monitoring and evaluation, around research and evidence. Increasingly, um, organizations like DFID are putting more of their ODA, their Overseas Development Assistance, into research programs. I'm leading a major research program that I'll talk about in a minute, which is funded through funding 
because DFID are putting, uh, the Department of International Development are putting so much emphasis on creating a better evidence base to inform policy and practice. Um, a number of students end up working with think tanks from Chatham House in the, to the Overseas Development Institute, Asia Foundation. Some go on to PhD research, so the, the, the course provides the, the building blocks, the foundations for going on to a more focused um, um, research topic in the form of their PhD. Others may end up actually working in uh, the UK government in uh, areas like the Treasury or the National Audit Office, which are not overseas uh, focused, but based on very important skills that are transferable into that kind of context. Being able to interpret data, being able to, to kind of look critically at data, knowing about research methods and research rigor is, is, is something that's clearly very important outside of the, the international development sphere as well. Um, and finally, quite a number of students end up uh, working in private sector organizations um, which focus on the, um, international development issues, whether through evaluation, um, research, policy advice and so on. And finally, the United Nations is another kind of area that students kind of move into. This is, that's to give you a, a kind of a brief overview of the course and what it aims to do. Um, and I'm sure you may have further questions, which I'll give some time for at the, the end uh, to, to, to feedback on. Now, I want to just jump in to give you a kind of sample of a, of a part of a lesson uh, that we teach in the battlefields of method. Um, and this actually is, is less about method than it is about what do you do with your research and how do you develop a, a policy brief um, which aims to have a, an impact out there in the real world on, 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 on policy makers. And so I'm, I'm going to give you a kind of a truncated, a very shortened version of a sample lesson that I gave to the students in the battlefield of method. Um, and the purpose of this is to, it comes towards the end of the course, so it's the second term, towards the end of the second term, after the students have been exposed to a whole range of different kinds of methods in the, in the first term, and in the second term, how do you apply these methods in practice? And in this session, it's really about how do you convert the research findings into a policy brief that can have an impact on policymakers? And this is the, the outline to give you an idea of what the session is about. Um, so, first of all, I introduce the research project um, that we're talking about in the session, which is a project that I'm leading at the moment. So it's a very, it's a, it's a real life case study. I then talk a little bit about the questions and challenges of evidence in this area, which is around drugs and, and violent conflict. Um, we then move into looking at, well, how do you influence policy? How do you make a, um, an impact on policy? And how do you go about preparing a policy brief? And we finish the ses session by doing a task, a case study task, in which the students divide into groups. Um, they're given uh, a case study, which is um, a, a, a real life case. It's a, a report prepared by the International Crisis Group on drugs production in Myanmar. And they produce a policy brief, um, which draws out the key messages for a named policymaker. So they have to decide who is the policymaker they're trying to influence and how. And in the, the, this leads to an assignment task in which um, students have to prepare their own policy brief, which is assessed um, by myself at, um, in the, in, and it is part of their assessed work. Okay, so very, very quickly, the, 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 the research project is one that I'm leading and it's, it's a UK government funded research project called Drugs and Disorder, Building Sustainable Peacetime Economies in the Aftermath of War. And what we're trying to do in this research is ask a very big and ambitious question. How do war economies get transformed into being peace economies in regions recovering from 
or experiencing armed conflict. And we, we're aiming to do three things in this, this research project. One, we, we want to generate a new evidence base on uh, a set of issues where the evidence base is very patchy and very, very politicized. I think in there, there are really very few other areas where there's such a mismatch between the quality of the evidence being generated on drugs and the gap between this evidence base and the mainstream policies, um, which are deeply problematic and I'll come to in a minute. We're also trying through this research to lead to new approaches and policy reforms and we're aiming to build up a network of research and institutions in the countries where we're doing the research. And the research is being conducted in Colombia, Afghanistan and in Myanmar. Um, and we're working with research teams in the in, in these three countries. We've chosen these countries for very obvious reasons. Afghanistan and Myanmar produce more than 90% of the global heroin production, and Colombia more than 50% uh, of, of global cocaine production. So these are areas which are, are really highly shaped by drug economies, by violent conflict, and to address the the problems of drugs and straight state fragility in these contexts will have global impacts um, so it's the potential to have a very major effect by shaping policies in these three countries and and globally and methodologically there's no time to discuss this now but we our approach is to try and work with mixed methods um, so gaining access to these borderland regions where we're doing the research which is where drugs are mainly produced consumed and trafficked is very difficult but we have research teams working in these 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 three countries we are working on, on geospatial imagery we're doing ethnographic and survey work in the field um, and also we're trying to present our research in novel ways so we're working with um, organizations that produce visual narratives, case studies and comic strips as you can see here to try and humanize the stories around drugs and so one of the things that you you would find in our in our course is about how you mix methods and how you triangulate approaches to ensure you counter biases or you counter or minimize the problems with um, a dependence on any one particular method. So that's really in a nutshell what the research is about now just to kind of stand back from that a second and think about well what do we know about the production of evidence the methodologies around the production of evidence for for um drugs i mean as, as i said already it's a deeply contested and deeply problematic um field where you have a lot of what i would call policy um policy-based evidence rather than evidence-based policies. In other words, evidence is driven by a set of concerns and of, of, of the policymakers rather than drawing upon the, the evidence itself. And uh, the policy field you know, is shaped really by this bigger agenda of trying to eradicate or to create a drug-free world. And this is linked to dealing with illicit cultivation, dealing with the demand for drugs, um, dealing with the production of, of, of um, psychotropic substances like methamphetamine, so not just um, drugs which are grown in fields like um, coca and, and, and poppy, to, to deal with the um, trafficking of drugs and money laundering, which is, is linked to drugs. How, what do we know about the, the kind of the success of these kinds of policies? Well, we know that the war on drugs has manifestly failed. And, uh, you know, this just gives you an example in terms of the demand has grown, the production has grown, the health related risks have grown, and the violence around the war on drugs has also grown. So, in lots of just at the kind of a, you know, at a basic level, we can see there's some you know, deeply problematic consequences of um, the war on drugs, and it's led to a lot all sorts of unintended consequences, including growing securitization and, and, and uh, coercive responses, the growth of the black economy and protection rackets as those involved seek protection because of its because it's um, an illegal activity. The way that um, 
there is what what we might call a policy displacement in the, the sense that more and more money is mm. in, invested in securitized approaches rather than kind of health based and um, approaches that there's a geographical displacement um, that a success in eradication in one area simply moves the problem across the border into another area similarly um, new substances are developed um, and there's problems around stigmatization and marginalization of drugs users linked to this kind of moral moralizing debate and so you know we can see very different things going on in the the, the world of drugs from on the one hand much more securitized approaches the war on drugs in the philippines is a good example to legalization in canada and so this kind of consensus around prohibition is fragmenting um, and there's a growing interest in in more developmental approaches how do you make drugs debates more cognizant of the sustainable development goals can drugs and the sustainable development goals be more integrated with each other rather than treating this as a, a securitized and a criminalized issue can we treat this as a development issue um, linked to these the pursuits of these of the sdgs so that's you know where in our project we're, we're trying to realign these debates um, and one of the big goal the big um kind of uh goals of this is to try and produce evidence that is going to shift these debates and at the same time in in the the course the the, the, the master's course we, we're continually thinking about how policy and evidence are not technical kind of questions they're linked to particular worldviews particular sets of political interests and this is particularly the case in, in the question of drugs so there are very problematic targets in relation to the war on drugs how many how many hectares of, of poppy fields have been eradicated how many seizures have been made for um, drug trafficking um, and, and these lead to very problematic forms of intervention. There's a, a, a tendency to fetishize drugs rather than to think about how they're connected to a social, economic and, and political context. In many ways, drugs is a, a faith-based ideology um, rather than an evidence-based set of policies. Um, there's also problems with how we as researchers kind of communicate and, 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 and develop our evidence base around drugs we tend to sit in disciplinary silos there's not enough interdisciplinary research on these issues um, there's not enough um, engagement with researchers from Myanmar from Colombia from Afghanistan and we think that's a big challenge that we need to address in the research there's often a failure to translate the findings of research into actionable points for policymakers. Um, and we need to also understand the political economy of policy making. So policy making, as I've already said, is not just about evidence. It's also about particular political and institutional predispositions. So when we're thinking about how to engage with the world of policy, we need to understand the political economy of how policy is developed. Um, how issues are framed, why they're aimed in certain ways, how they get translated into certain kind of actions, and how we as researchers can intervene in those processes, whether we're talking about understanding the political context, whether we're talking about understanding individual actors, whether we're thinking about what kinds of knowledge is going to be more or less um, compelling for particular types of um, defense or humanitarian or drug actors. So to finish off um, and run, run out of time really, um, what's the next step we, we do in this session with the students is think about, okay, in light of, this is an example of a research project. This is, these are some of the debates around policy making in the world of drugs and the problems with evidence. How do you go about developing a policy brief to shape and influence policymakers? So, one or two quick points. I mean, the first thing is a policy brief is a short document. This is not a long research report. It's condensing the long and complex research reports into 
a set of key compelling messages that will attract the attention of policymakers and also give clear directions to policymakers about things that they can do in concrete terms as a result of this evidence. So you need to be clear about, first of all, this is a standalone document that can be read without reading the full research report. It needs to be clear to the target audience. Is it focusing on UNODC, the UN Office for Drugs and Crime? Is it focusing on the World Bank? Is it trying to target Save the Children Fund? You know, who, who is the audience? Try and focus on a single issue to the extent possible. Um, it's not going to have much traction if you, you, you outline a whole range of different issues and say they're very complex um, and something needs to be done about them. You need to focus down on something that you think A is going to be interesting and attractive to the donor and is something that they can actually act upon. Um, so it's a short, a short document, two to four pages, no more than 1500 words usually and that, certainly that's how, how we sit in, the, um, in this exercise. Um, you need to refer to the content of the longer report, it needs to be written very clearly and as I said it has to have very specific recommendations and targets. So you know, it's a different skill from writing up um, a long research report and it's something that needs to be designed imaginatively and be visually appe um, appealing to include graphs, to include text boxes, to include photos and maps um, it, that breaks up the text and so it doesn't have long paragraphs of text. Um, it needs to be able to be something that um, captures the attention of, of busy poly policy makers um, uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a compelling way. And then the structure um, can vary from, from between different policy briefs, but um, a fairly standard approach is to have you know, your key messages up front. You know, when this arrives on a policymaker's desk and they look at this, they're going to look at the first few sentences and they're going to say, well, okay, so what? What can I do about this? So what are the messages you're trying to communicate here? Introducing the issue or the problem um, and then say something about the, the approach that was taken, what the methods were and what the key findings were and then what the, kind, the, the implications and the recommendations are that flow out of this analysis. There is no single um, you know, correct structure, but I think the, your, your, your policy brief will need to have these key components. Um, and the, you know, one of the you know, people who are good at this for you, the, main, the most important thing is get your key message, message in so that they're clear, they're concise, they're compelling, and they attract the policymakers' attention. If they if they fail to do that, the policymaker is not going to bother reading the rest of it. You've got to attract them in at the beginning. So there's quite a skill around doing this um, this kind of a policy brief, which is is a different skill from the more intricate and uh, uh, more ex kind of the long winded so the, um, the um, complex kind of process of writing up a research report. So I think that you know, the thing to to highlight here as well is that the course is is de teaching different skills which are, are which are which are important whether a researcher or whether you're a policymaker now in in the in the session itself and this the one this is your la the last slide here the 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 students divide into groups and prepare policy briefs first with uh, um, the example of uh, the case of, of drugs and the international crisis group in Myanmar and then they p develop one based on a research report from Afghanistan. So I, I've gone on for too long. I'm now um, happy to answer questions. If you'd like to email me, jg27 at soas.ac.uk, I'll, I'll do the best to answer them.